In this video, we're talking about the first derivative test. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to use the first derivative test to find any extrema of the function f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 2x squared. So what is the first derivative test? Well, we call it the first derivative test because we use the first derivative to test the critical points of the function to say where the function is increasing and decreasing and therefore to draw conclusions about extrema, which are local and global maxima and minima. So when we want to use the first derivative test, we're going to follow the same process every time. So you're always going to use the same method to find critical points of the function and then use the first derivative test to test them and then draw conclusions about extrema. So here's what we're going to do first. We're always going to start with our original function f of x and we're going to take its first derivative, which is of course f prime of x. So the first derivative of this particular function, if we take the derivative of the right hand side term by term, the derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed. The derivative of negative 2x squared is negative 4x. This is our first derivative. Our next step is always going to be to set the first derivative equal to zero. So we say zero equals and then whatever we got here on the right hand side. Then we want to solve this equation for x and usually that's going to involve factoring this right hand side. So in this particular case, we can factor out a 4x, so we're going to say 4x times x squared minus 1. We can factor x squared minus 1, so we get 4x times quantity x plus 1 times quantity x minus 1. And now the right hand side is factored as completely as possible. We can use zero theorem to set each factor equal to zero individually because if zero is equal to this right hand side, if 4x is equal to zero, then the entire right hand side is equal to zero since we have all three of these factors multiplied together. If x plus one equals zero, then the right hand side will equal zero. If x minus one is equal to zero, the right hand side will equal zero. So we can set these equal to zero individually. We can say zero is equal to 4x. We can say zero equal to x plus one and we can say zero equals x minus one. All of these equations will make this equation true. So the results then that we get here, for this first equation, if we divide both sides by four, we get x equals zero. Here, if we subtract one from both sides, we get x equals negative one. And here, if we add one to both sides, we get x is equal to positive one. These then, because they're the solutions to setting the derivative equal to zero, these are the potential critical points of the function. Remember that a critical point is a point at which the function changes direction. So if the function is increasing and then hits a critical point, it'll start decreasing. Or if the function is decreasing and hits a critical point, at that point it will start increasing. So it changes direction from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. But we can't conclude that these three values are in fact critical points until we've used the first derivative test to test them. So here's how we test them. Here's what the first derivative test looks like. Once we get these values of critical points, we want to set up a simple number line. So here's what that's going to look like. We just draw a simple number line like this, and we're going to call the ends of the number line always negative infinity and positive infinity. And then we're going to graph these three values on the number line. So we have negative one, that's our leftmost point. So we'll say negative one here, then zero, then positive one. So these are our three potential critical points. We graph them from right to left according to their values. Notice that plotting these three potential critical points on a number line divides the entire number line into four intervals. So we have this first interval here from negative infinity to negative one, the second interval from negative one to zero, the third interval from zero to positive one, and the fourth interval from one to positive infinity. We have to test each of these intervals, which means that we have to pick a test value inside each interval. It doesn't matter which value we pick as long as it falls within the interval. So in other words, for interval number one here, we have to pick a test value that's between negative infinity and negative one. Pick something easy. So in this case, we'll pick negative two. Because negative two is between negative infinity and negative one, we'll be able to use the first derivative test with negative two to determine the function's behavior on the interval negative infinity to negative one. In other words, we'll be able to use this test value of negative two to say whether or not the function is increasing or decreasing on this interval negative infinity to negative one. Because these values, negative one, zero, and one, are the only potential critical points, that means they're the only points where the function can change direction. So the function can't possibly change direction inside any of these intervals, which is why we can just pick one single value to represent the behavior of the function over the entire interval. 
So we'll pick test values on each interval. Picking a value between negative 1 and 0, let's pick negative 1 half. Between 0 and 1, we'll pick positive 1 half. And between 1 and positive infinity, we'll pick positive 2. So these values in green are going to be our test interval. And the reason, again, that it's called the first derivative test is because we're going to plug these test values into our first derivative. So I always like to remind myself by writing f prime, the first derivative, next to my number line so I remember where I'm plugging everything in. So we'll start with this leftmost test value, negative 2. We're going to plug that into our first derivative. So we're going to say f prime of negative 2 is going to be equal to Plugging that into 4x cubed minus 4x, we get 4 times negative 2 cubed minus 4 times negative 2. That's going to give us here, negative 2 cubed is a negative 8, negative 8 times 4 is a negative 32. Then we have minus 4 times a negative 2, which is minus a negative 8 or plus 8. So negative 32 plus 8 is going to give us a negative 24. We'll come back to this value in a second. Let's plug in the other three test values, and then we'll look at what conclusions we can draw. So plugging negative 1 half into the first derivative, f prime of negative 1 half gives us 4 times quantity negative 1 half cubed minus 4 times negative 1 half. When we simplify here, negative 1 half cubed is a negative 1 eighth. Negative 1 eighth times 4 is a negative 1 half. And then we have negative 4 times a negative 1 half, which is a positive 2. So negative 1 half plus 2 is a positive 3 halves, a positive value. Let's plug in positive 1 half. So f prime of positive 1 half is equal to 4 times 1 half cubed minus 4 times 1 half. 1 half cubed is a positive 1 eighth times 4 is 1 half. 4 times 1 half is 2, so we get minus 2. That's going to give us a negative 3 halves. And then our last test value of positive 2, we get f prime of positive 2 is 4 times 2 cubed minus 4 times 2, which is going to be 8 times 4, or 32 minus 8. That's going to be a positive 24. So the resulting values we get here, the specific values, are not important. What's important is whether or not those values are positive or negative. So this value here of negative 24, all that matters is that it's negative. So this is less than 0, we get a negative value right here. Positive 3 halves, all that matters is it's greater than 0, that's a positive value. Negative 3 halves, that's less than 0, it's a negative value. And positive 24, that's greater than 0, that's a positive value. So we want to take these conclusions about negative and positive values and plot them here on our number line. Plugging in the test value of negative 2 resulted in a negative value. So we want to go ahead and put negative right there above the negative 2. Plugging in negative 1 half gave us a positive value. Plugging in positive 1 half gave us a negative value and plugging in positive 2 gave us a positive value, so we get positive right here. So what the first derivative test tells us is that when we plug in a test value and we get a negative result, the function's behavior over the interval represented by that test value is decreasing. So if we get a negative result, the function is decreasing on this interval. Because we got a positive result for this test value, the test value that represents the interval from negative 1 to 0, that means the function is increasing over that interval. So the function is increasing over this interval. Then the function is decreasing over this interval, and then increasing again over this interval. And I like to draw in those arrows because it makes the function's behavior very visual. I can see a visual representation of the function's behavior. And because the function changes direction at each of these values, x equals negative 1, 0, and positive 1, I can confirm that negative 1, 0, and positive 1 all represent critical points of the function. So I have a critical point here at x equals negative 1, I have a critical point here at x equals 0, and a critical point here at x equals positive 1. And I can see that because to the left of negative 1, my function is decreasing. Then when it hits negative 1, it starts increasing. So if it was decreasing and then starts increasing once it hits this value, I know my function changed direction there, and therefore I have a critical point. Same thing here at 0. My function was increasing to the left of 0, and then once it got to 0, it started decreasing. So 0 represents a critical point. And so does x equals 1 because I had decreasing on the left and increasing on the right. So I do in fact have three critical points. Now I have to say whether or not these critical points represent local and or global maxima or minima. 
you can only have extrema where you have critical points. I just have to plug in these values, negative one, zero, and positive one, to the original function to see what the value of the function is at those critical points so that I can draw a conclusion about the extrema at these three critical points. So plugging negative one into the original function, we're gonna say f of negative one, and then plugging it into this function here, I have x to the fourth, so negative one to the fourth, minus two times x squared, or negative one squared. Negative one to the fourth is a positive one. Negative one squared is a positive one. Negative two times positive one is a negative two. So the value I get then is negative one. We'll come back to that in a second, but first let's plug in x equals zero and x equals one. So f of zero is gonna give me zero to the fourth minus two times zero squared. So I'm gonna get zero minus zero, or just zero. And then plugging in x equals one, I'm gonna have f of positive one, which is gonna be one to the fourth minus two times one squared, which is gonna give me one minus two, or a negative one. So when x was equal to negative one, y is equal to negative one, so I can say that the coordinate point here is negative one, negative one. When x was equal to zero, y was equal to zero, so I can say the coordinate point here is zero, zero. And when x was equal to positive one, y was negative one, so the coordinate point here is positive one, negative one. Now what we can tell just by looking at these coordinate points is that the function has global minima at x equals negative one and x equals positive one and a local maximum at x equals zero. You'll get more and more comfortable drawing that conclusion just from the coordinate points as you do more of these problems. But for now, let's look at the graph of this function to make it really clear. If you can graph the function, it's always gonna help you double check the results of your first derivative test. So if we look here at the function, here's what we see. We have this graph and it kind of mimics the arrows that we drew, which should make sense. So we can see that our function is decreasing from negative infinity to negative one. And you can see here, this is x equals negative one, this line right here. So we can see the function coming in from left to right, decreasing until it hits x equals negative one. Then we saw that the function starts increasing from negative one to zero. So from negative one until x equals zero, right here, the function is increasing. Then it starts decreasing again from zero to negative one, and then at negative one all the way to positive infinity, it starts increasing again. So the results that we found about where the function is increasing and decreasing matches the graph of the function here. So then we can go ahead and say that the value of the function at x equals negative one is negative one. So we can say this point here is negative one, negative one, right here. We can say that this value we found, we just found this point, was zero, zero, and that this point right here that we just found was positive one, negative one. So what this shows us then is that the function is never going to reach a value lower than y equals negative one, right? These two points right here along this line that we found, these two critical points right here, the function is never going to go below these two points. These are the lowest values the function will ever obtain because we're going up here to the left and up here to the right, and there's never gonna be a point where the function starts coming back down. If there were, we would have found another critical point. So we're gonna increase up here to the left and increase up here to the right. These are the lowest values the function will ever obtain. Therefore, the points negative one, negative one, and positive one, negative one, are the global minima of the function. They are the lowest points on the function. So we can call this point here a global min. We can call this point here a global minimum. And the reason we can have two global minimums, normally you can only ever have one, but if they both have the exact same y value, then you can have two global minimums. This point here, zero, zero, we can only call a local maximum because it's the highest point in its neighborhood or in its region. It's the highest point of the function around zero, zero because you can see that the function slopes down to either side of zero, zero. So this is the highest point in this area, but obviously the function reaches values that are higher than zero. So all of these points up here have higher y values then our point zero, zero, and same thing over here, all of these points have higher y values than the point zero, zero. But zero, zero is the highest point in this area, so we call it a local maximum. 
So those are all the conclusions that we can draw about the extrema of this function. We have two global minimums and a global maximum. And that's how you use the first derivative test to find critical points, test the function's behavior to see where it's increasing or decreasing, and then use what you know about where the function increases and decreases to draw conclusions about local and global extrema.